Hi, this is Richard Enos with Collective Evolution, and we've come to Vancouver to interview a very special person, Cal Washington, who's the co-founder of the InPower Movement, and he's going to tell us how we can take our power back. Uh, he's worked with uh, programs designed to prevent smart meters from being installed in, in houses, uh, and now he's working on some programs involving uh, 5G vaccines, and uh, specifically 5G is what we're going to be focusing on today, understanding if we feel that 5G is hazardous to our health, how we can prevent installations from happening in our communities. So welcome, Cal. It's a pleasure to meet you, and it's going to be a fun interview. Oh, thanks, Richard. Okay. So where I wanted to start, because, you know, I've, I've seen a lot of your stuff online, and, you know, fascinating stuff involving the law, involving what we can do to take our power back, what happens in court, what's really going on, you know, beneath the surface. A lot of interesting information that's really valuable to us. So I'd like us to start with sort of a broad, broad overview about law, understanding law. And I'm going to start you off with something from the Declaration of Independence uh, and as a context for understanding about something called natural law or the spiritual realm, as you refer to it. So let me just read a little bit from the Declaration of Independence and then we'll, we'll take off from there. It starts off, when in the course of human events it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them, a decent respect to the opinions of mankind require that they should declare the cause which impel them to the separation. So they're talking about the separation from Great Britain and they're explaining we have the right to separate. And they say, and this the famous phrase, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So they're stating, they're coming from a place where they feel we have natural rights as human beings. This is this is the, the basis of all law, natural law or, or spiritual law. So maybe we can start with that and your understanding of that and your understanding of you know, whether this is indeed our, our natural rights and, and, and these are things that we can, we can reach for and we can fight for and we can actually achieve. Well, I agree. And, and you know, some key words in there is it's self-evident and... Um... And, and also what they say, you know, rights including, and they just, among those, so there are, there are more that it insinuates that there are, there's more to this, than, but at least that. And, um, and the fact that they declared it, so they, they, um, they worked within the system that they were under and did things in a proper way. So they, it, wasn't, um, it wasn't done in... It ended up being violent, but it wasn't. It started in violence. It, it was like this is what. It wasn't based on the the might that the power that they were using it was based in something true and you know universal to all human beings. And it was done in a in a peaceful way. It was done on paper and um, de and declared. Uh, um, had you know who they were sending it to just went okay, we agree that would have been it. Right. So it, it ended up in violence only because the other side of the of the um, correspondence didn't agree. Well, right, and and they say they go on to list the instances where they tried to appeal to the to Great Britain and talk to them about you know the different things that they were doing, which you know they were saying this is tyrannical and this is unacceptable and this is not you know we're not going to accept this and so on and so forth. And they continue to try to negotiate and and they say well we shouldn't uh, we shouldn't change government just like that for transient and you know easy causes, but after all this that we've done, we feel justified and we feel like we have God on our side or you know, the, the divine judge on our side in declaring that we are cutting ties with Great Britain and we are free and independent and, and we will create our own system of government to protect those freedoms. Well, exactly. So it's, um, it was a declaration and it was done in a 
in a proper way and they went through the proper you know steps of trying to rectify the situation and um, even at this which is a which is a fairly drastic move it still was not um, violent in any way it was just this is what we are now going to do and here's the reasons why and there are sound reasons and um, you know how do you feel about that they didn't put that in there but it but it but that's the intent of it <clears throat> this is what we're doing um, please acknowledge that and um, they didn't and th th therefore there was a, a conflict but it, it's it's the idea that they did it in the proper way and uh, they they went to their you know there's a biblical principle you go to your brother in private and then um, you try and resolve something and then you then you escalate it to a couple of witnesses and then you escalate it to the elders and all, like you go up in in order you don't just jump to uh, you know um, to start shooting right so right. and they, and so they did everything according to proper principles and they wrote it very eloquently um, and it wasn't it was ignored and they you know it ended up in a war right now this was an incredible time in history uh, but we could say we're in an incredible time in history right now wouldn't you say and that we're sort of facing the same situation where we're seeing uh, an onslaught of tyranny from those who are governing us and we're you know having to make some decisions about are we going to take back our power and create sort of a different kind of system to live in? What are your like? What are your thoughts on that? Uh... Well, yeah, and, and going back to the um, the American Revolution, you have to understand the context of that because we look at, we we're all, we're looking in hindsight and it looks like this heroic thing, but when those guys signed that Declaration of Independence, if it didn't work and they didn't win the war, they would have all been hung for treason. Right. So they, there, was a, there was a commitment to this. This is like do or die. There was no, there's no middle ground. There's no, um, by putting your name on those documents, you were, um, you were committed 100% to the, like, if it doesn't work, I'm going to be hung. And they would have known that right. um, this was not a. Uh, so you got to understand the context. They look like heroes, but at the time they wouldn't have known how this was all going to play out. Right. They. This was um, a, a risk, a calculated risk. Right. And and we're at that same point where if we don't actually get involved and commit to uh, a serious change there's going to be some dire uh, results of that, apparently. So that's, we're at that kind of crossroads again, mm. worldwide, not just a, one country. And, and so there's a feeling that we need to come to a greater awareness of what's going on in order to be prepared to, to, to be active and stand for something, stand for something that's important to us and stand against things that are, you know, hazardous to our health, like, you know, we're going to be talking about later five the five G networks that they're trying to set up, right? Yeah, and uh, again, on, in the in the Declaration of Independence, I think as you alluded to, they had a sense, and it wasn't. I don't think it, I think it was more than a um, you know like a belief. They understood that God was real, and that there were um, there were rules that were higher than than the apparent rules of, of what a, uh, you know, a, a temporal being could set up. And they were wanted to exercise those rules and they felt that um, those were very real and that there was very real help for that. And, um, you know, in order for you to sign your name on something like that, when, um, you know, the military capabilities of the American of how the things how they were at that time compared to the British, um, you, that was a big risk. Right. You know, they had to have really believed in something more than a belief. They had to know that the, um, this was possible and actually needed to be ha happen. So they they were willing to sign on that. 
and they, they felt like they were in the moral high ground, right? They were in the position of truth and they were aligned with, you know, the spiritual uh, forces of justice. Yes. Right? And that's, that's what they said. It's self-evident. And um, they wanted to exercise that and, to, and take back their authority at that time. Okay, great. So we find ourselves where we are now under all sorts of different laws and you know a lot of which we don't agree with and they're they're just coming at us taxation and you know different technologies being introduced different stuff just being introduced into our society i'm wondering if you can give us a bit of an overview of when you step down from this natural law that we talked about and try to explain what kind of laws are we actually living under and how did they come to be uh, you know, the laws of, of the, the, like Canada, the United States, Europe? I know it's a big question. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, you, it's, it's over a long period of time and, and, you know, the more they're digging up, they're, they're finding out some of these things go back further than what we've been told. But um, by and large, what I found, uh, because I had a, you know, as I was growing up, I had this idea of how things were, and that was obviously placed there, however. And um, so I had an idea, and most people have this idea of, of how it works, but what I found was when I got in there, it was different. In there, you mean in, into the court? Into the court system. So yeah. I was dragged into the court system, and I found out that it wasn't as I thought it was. And it was just that, um, that kind of drove me uh, because I wanted to find out what it was. Because well, what, what did you think it was, first of all? Like, what, what were your thoughts? Well, I thought, you know, from the TV or whatever, I don't know how I got it. But anyway, I thought the courts were about a, um, a balanced system and finding the truth and, and then um, finding the justice in that for, for all and, and coming to a, a agreement, or, you know, or a, an understanding, or le even if it was just a ruling, that it would have been fair for fair. all, for all concerned. Great, yeah, and I think that's a common perception, and and that's the perception that's been put on us yes. to, to have to think that, okay, everything's all right with the world. The government's, you know, controlled by the courts, and the courts are just and and, and independent and yeah. independent. Yeah. Okay. So that's that was my understanding going in there. And, you know, the, the few times that I had, you know, watched something or been in there, it, it seemed like that. It, it didn't, um, it, I didn't notice that it wasn't that before until I was, it was about me and, and, and I had to go there, you know, con like almost at least twice a month. And um, that's when it, it, it started to dawn on me what was going on because some of the things that the judge would say would just didn't make sense in that understanding of what was going on and so i tried to figure out what was going on i could tell there was some some other agenda going on in there and um couldn't put my finger on it because it didn't make any sense in hindsight i can see what it what it was but at the time i didn't know and so i just started asking questions and you know and because of my makeup I resisted. Like I, I kind of went, no, I'm, I don't like this. This is not. This is wrong, at a, at a core level. So I kind of put my foot down a little bit, right, and um, and was able to keep my foot down <laughs> through uh, a long period of time and a lot of flack. So and, can you can you give us a, a sort of an example of how, in a court situation, you actually you know did something a little different? You said no, I don't accept that, or well, I, I didn't really do that at first. Um, it was more, the judge would say something and I would ask, like, I, I, I can remember saying one time, where am I that you just said that? Right. Like, what is, like, what country am I in? What court, like, what, where is, like, what has happened here? Just that question and pointed right at the judge. I had no, you know, I just, like, what is going on in here? And the judge looked at me and she goes, um, you're very sophisticated, Mr. Mr. Washington, keep going. And then I went in my head, like, what does that mean? Because you got to understand the context. I'm like, I have no, don't even know, like, I can't figure out what's going so that on. that really 
blew your mind that more even though like oh now what does like, that mean and what is it really something going on here that's not evident it's and what yeah and surface. what what does keep going mean like what did i just do that what that i'm supposed to keep doing it i just asked a question because it, i was puzzled about where i'm standing that these things are being said to me right. and um so it was that it was a few things like that and a couple of police officers also shook my hand after our encounter and said keep going i know what you're doing and you're like glad you do because <laughs> <laughs> Because I got, you know, was, you know, I started getting inklings as I learned. But, but something didn't seem just in what was being said to you and the way things were proceeding. And, and you were kind of like, what yeah. gives you the right to say that or do that? Like, what is it? In the context of this is a, you know, independent, um, balanced, just system. Yeah. There's something else going on here because uh, otherwise I wouldn't be hearing these things and, and seeing these things. So... Um, it was that that kind of kept me going, and um, and then, you know, I didn't like the idea of, of some institution telling me how my family was going to be from here on in, and how my children were going to be um, raised, and, and, you know, their life is going to be this. And um, I went, no, I don't think so, because there's a higher order of things, and um, a family is... It, um, it, it has a it's a unit and it has to function in a certain way otherwise the the offspring end up off balance and then that can lead to you know the society starts to break down so the, it's it's all of that all tied together that i resisted this yeah sort of the self-determination of the family unit and that was and that's what you really railed against at first right? yeah that's what that's what gave me my strength to get through all of that because i had to go through a lot it was um, overwhelming Okay, so you, based on principles, you challenged that, and in the course of that whole process, you just sort of opened up to more investigation into what the heck is going on and how I actually got some power to do something, and you want, you're hungry for more yeah. information about it. Yeah, and so that led to what, you know, what are termed as um, gurus of sovereignty and, you know, however you describe that, it doesn't really matter, but you know what I'm talking about, the, the people that have methods of, dealing with court or, um, you know, ideas about how things are and everything. So I went, I learned a bunch of, of those and tried everything. I was willing to try anything. That's, that's another thing. I had no, um, I wouldn't say I didn't have fear because I did have fear in the beginning, but I, I was still willing to um, try anything. And certain things ended up with certain results that, <laughs> that weren't in my favor and, um, so you would stop doing that and move to the next thing. And um, that's, that was the journey. It was mostly trial and error. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so let's, let's step back and, and sort of paint a picture of law and the law that we're under. And, you know, out of what you've learned, I know you've talked about um, the idea that we're actually living under a system called law merchant, right? Lex Mercatoria. Uh, that is the, uh, that is one of the things that we're living under. Okay. Yeah. So it's layered and, and that's on purpose so that you don't see number one, that there are layers and number two, that they're, you know, um, how to operate in higher layers. So the bottom layers are meant to keep you, um, sort of hypnotized and, um, boxed in so you don't see anything else except that. And, um, and, you know, people that are, end up in the, uh, just us system go to what's called law school. And, you know, this is not, you know, with all due respect, um, to anybody that's done that, you go to a law school that is controlled by others. So what you learn there is told, you're told to learn this, 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 this regurgitate that on a test and now you are a lawyer mm. just that if you just thought about that for a second um, if they omitted anything you wouldn't know right so therefore the the system um, proliferates and 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 is self um, organizing and, and keeps keeps the system um, alive because there's less knowledge that's put out from the beginning so those that are um, 
in that system only understand uh, what they've been told. Mm -hmm. And so it was that, um, I understand, once I learned that there was another, uh, like a higher jurisdiction, and I started operating, again, just trial and error, that's when my life started to change. There was still a, a period of time where they fought back, but there was a definite mark in time when they started running from me instead of me from them. Okay. And that, that's the key. Um, and that's what is, uh, you know, as, as I kept going down that road, you know, it just solidified and solidified and solidified that this is actually true. And uh, I can't be moved from it anymore. It, you know, no matter how many letters I get saying there's no basis in law for what you're doing, I just ignore them because it, <laughs> I, I'm past that. Ultimately, when, if, if you ever get into that point where you have to, you know, go to court, you, you know that you, you've got the right on your side and, and, and the court will have to respect that because that's... It's, it's past that point. It's even past that. They won't, I will, I will never appear in a court. Interesting. I, like, I, you know, some of the, the thing I say is I would have to be um, dragging a dead baby and firing an automatic weapon into the air before I would be dragged into a court. Okay. And, and you're, you're a person that, that the system doesn't want in court and they know no. you're going to cause all sorts of trouble and... Yes. Okay. Irreparable damage. So it, it, they've already tried that and I went through the whole thing, you know, including time in jail and um, that's the best they've got other than, you know, extreme violence. Okay. So um, there's nothing, they don't have anything else. <laughs> okay. So if, if you talked about going into a higher jurisdiction right? Learning that you can operate from a higher jurisdiction. So can you, is it possible to explain like the jurisdiction that you're at, what you've realized is, is the law that's operating at that level? Well, there's an ancient um, commercial system and it's, it's called um, in modern times, well, even in old times, it's called law merchant. Lex Mercatoria is the um, Latin name. It turns out as more archaeological digs come up that this this went back further than than even we thought. And um, but it's a it's a um, it's a jurisdiction that is more like customs and um, principles of operation in order for merchants to. Um, uh, conduct themselves internationally. As as things started to change and people got into boats and, and started moving large cargo, you know, around the known world at the time, and having international, what would be called international fairs, where they would sell wares, etc. You had a lot of transient people from all over the place, from different languages, different money systems, different laws, different ways of doing things. Right. And of course that if left alone would just be mayhem. Right. So this system of doing things um, evolved and it was dynamic. It wasn't fixed like regular laws where it was more work with the times and, and was based on principles of fairness. And um, all the merchants agreed to this because it actually worked. Mm. And it was fast litigation as well. If there was a problem, it was done within a day, not within you know, eight months to a year in the normal common law way. So you didn't have to have burdens of proof that you had to have in the common law uh, system. It was more based on truth in an affidavit form or swearing to it. And, um, and then a group of other merchants would, would decide what was true. And they were trying to get to the bottom of it quickly. Yeah. And the reason for this was because uh, ships would leave at high tide and if there was a problem that ship was going that day like within four or five hours when that high tide comes in that ship is gone and and there's no there's no way of stopping there's it. no remedy because that guy is gone he may never yeah. ever come back yeah and um 
or the ship has cargo that you know you claim is yours yeah, or whatever. You, you what, can't stop. You can't stop all these ships just no, because you're you're arguing about something. No, because right. a, a lot of the stuff was perishable as well. So you couldn't argue for eight months about uh, a load of bananas because at the end of it, once you find out who owns the bananas, well, the bananas don't exist anymore. So that the the, the law system didn't as it was didn't work for merchants. It wasn't um, dynamic enough, and so this thing called law merchant came up. And you can read, um, you can read on the internet. And there's a, just so you know, there is a uh, vested uh, agenda to call it a myth that it didn't exist. Uh huh. But even within inside of the, you know, some of the treaties I, I read, they give examples of the court actually functioning. They have roles, like the, the historical roles of actual cases are, exist. Like, mm -hmm. So it existed, but they say it, that there was no Lex Mercatoria because it's not codified. You can't find the book of law number 1.8, blah, blah, blah. Okay. But it wasn't like that, and that's the part they leave out. Right. So it was functioning very well. Once everybody came to an agreement about it, everybody was satisfied that in, in that domain, it, it's, it's really a good system. It was a very good system, and it's and it started to compete with the common law system, with the king's courts. Um, people liked this better because it was. I mean, corruption. Who knows how that was? Because historical books always leave that stuff out. But um, either one of those things could have had some corruption in it. But but it was more the quickness of, yeah. of everything. So in today's world, it's called summary judgment. Okay. So things are done. Um, not based on proving something on it's based on probabilities and the judge will tell you that okay but probabilities but see my way of thinking i'm going you're operating in lex mercatoria i know what you're doing mm. so they try and disguise it and but it's actually lex mercatoria okay so so you're saying that lex mercatoria started to kind of get into the domestic legal systems of countries because they liked the way it was operating for the merchants and the international sort of shipping and, and all yeah. that. So, so it was it the people uh, that, that wanted this introduced into certain areas of their, their domestic lives in countries? Well, partly. So you had um, what were called pie powder courts that were at the fairs and they were um, very transient. And then they started to, to get more um, solidified and that and they were called staple courts and there were staple towns which were mostly the port towns so there was an actual building and it got a little more um, you know present not so you know disappearing with the with the uh, fair so there was a building and that you know it started to become a little more uh, solidified yeah and um, and the king was okay with this but then it started to you know it it started to take over and he wasn't getting his cut and all, you know, there, there's a million reasons why, but so what Lord Mansfield did, who was the chief justice, what we would call chief justice at the time, they fused it into the common, into the common law. So now the merchants could actually go into the common law court, but still operate in Lex Mercatoria. Okay. So the judges were told to take judicial notice of the Lex Mercatoria or law merchant when that when a commercial case came in it was meant to go faster in the same way and 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 with the same kind of principles and um over time they just stopped talking about it but it's still going on and that's once you understand that and you go and sit in court for a while um you'll see that that's what's going on in there and it just dawns on you, it, 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 the light bulb goes off. Oh, I see what they're doing. And that's why when I was first in there, like what's going on in here? There's something not how I thought it was supposed to be. And that's the reason, because they're, they're operating in commerce. Okay, so can, can you take us from, from those origins to you know, this idea people talk about that Canada is really a corporation and they use capital letters and birth certificate and, and like, like where we where we are now, how did this become? Uh, you know, we're talking about Canada, and United States. Let's say, can you explain to us how Lex Mercatoria is operating here? Well, Canada is a is a special uh, example because 
it started off as a corporation. And that was the Hudson Bay Company. And, in that, and, you got, and people don't understand this. It was the government. And it was for 200 years. It wasn't like, you know, fly by night. It was entrenched here. Mm -hmm. It had 200 years to, to really <laughs> clamp down. And, um, and it did. Uh, the problem with it, so so you understand that it started off as a corporation. Started off as a corporation, the Hudson's Bay Company. Company. It is a for-profit cor and read the charter. That will, it's self-explanatory. Number one, it was a, meant to be a monopoly, complete. Yeah, they were allowed to use navy, armed forces, armaments, cannons to enforce all this. They were allowed to take people's stuff if they were if they disobeyed it. Like if you got caught um, dealing with the with the natives uh, directly, you everything was confiscated. Your canoe, your horses, your like, all that stuff was happening. So these are all all the people that came from Europe and were the settlers in in Canada, right? So yeah. this they were uh, under the jurisdiction of this corporation. Yeah, and that actually went into where the United States is now because this is all predates the United States. So. Right. Um, you can see the map, the original map, and of course they you know, kept expanding it um, illegally. Um, so, and then that whole thing, um, if you read the charter, they were allowed to make their own laws and enforce them, and they were allowed to have courts. So just, you know, the bells should be going off. That's, that was in the charter, courts. So a guy was sitting up there, like acting like a judge, but it was a Hudson Bay court. Right. How do you think that's going to go? When you're charged of whatever it is, putting your canoe in the water without paying your, your, your 10 shillings, yeah. you lose every time in there. Yeah, or you go and try to, to say Hudson's Bay is being unfair to me because, you know, they're taking away this and, and you're going and talking to an employee of Hudson's, of Hudson's Bay, Bay sitting in the judge's and the same thing is today. It has not changed. And once you read that, uh, that document, you'll, you'll, and if you put it in today's context, you'll see that it's identical. It has not changed. It changed for 26 years when they uh, passed the British North America Act. Right. But if you go into the his history of that, that was only to force the surrender of the Hudson Bay Charter. That was the sole reason for it, because that... It, because that's what happened within a year of the, the Dominion being created. They surrendered the charter. They couldn't compete. So the Queen of England got the charter back from yes. the corporation that was Hudson's Bay. Right? Yes, because you, what you'll also see in that document, it was perpetual. There was no end to this document. And it was signed by a king. Done. And the, here's another problem with that document. The cut to the king as written was very meager, like a couple of elks and a beaver, this, that, like nothing. Right. So somebody along the way of 200 years would have went, went and looked at the document, you know, this cut we've been sending, you know, on a nod, 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 wink, wink, which I'm sure that's how it started. According to this, we got to send a couple animals over there if they show up. And, you know, and so they probably went, we're not sending you nothing. And there's nothing you can do about it because it's signed by your great grandfather. And they couldn't revoke it because it was signed or at least didn't want to revoke it. But whatever happened, they, she formed a dominion, competed with it, put a railroad in and they surrendered and then she got it. So it was, it was surrendered officially to Victoria, her successors and heirs, which means it's still owned by a, su a successor or an heir of Victoria. So Queen Elizabeth is still the Queen of Canada. She's the owner of the Hudson Bay Company. She's the owner of that charter and therefore has that, uh, the authority to make her own laws and enforce them. I know you've talked about the Queen taking an oath on the 1611 King James Bible. Uh, in terms of her governance of Canada. So could you elaborate on that, what the meaning of that taking the oath is and, and so forth? Well, that's uh, a, a deep thing, but um, 
basically she has to <clears throat> um, uphold the laws. You can read her oath yourself, but it, she has to uphold the laws and customs of Canada and her other possessions. And so understand that the word possessions is in there and think about that. And, um, and she has to uphold the King James Bible itself and actually defend it and look that word up. It's not a passive word. It's, um, it means um, it's an action word. You have to take action. You can't just, um, you know, agree with it. It's, uh, it's, there's action involved with defending. So uh, read those words. And um, so that's what she is sworn to do. Now, at the same time, because uh, Victoria, she is the owner of the Hudson Bay Company, um, or at least could be. One, some, some heir of Victoria is, is the owner of the Hudson Bay Company. And, um, but the Hudson Bay Charter has limitations to it, and the laws that they make in, in the, under that charter can't be repugnant to the common law, and, and of course cannot be repugnant to her oath. And in that charter, all the governors and upper management had to swear an oath of fealty back to the king or queen of, of England. And that was to keep the um, common law as the real law. Because if you just give somebody the, the, the ability to make their own laws and enforce them, it could end up um, becoming its own country. Right. <laughs> and you know just break away really so um they always had to swear an oath back and that's still happening today so anybody that gets into government or police or any um even uh, i knew a, a lady who worked at the liquor store she had to swear an oath to queen elizabeth so all of these things are um still in effect so you have to swear an oath back to it, what you know what would be deemed a foreign uh monarch if we were a real country, but we're not. So we're still under that charter. All the things that are that are written in there are still happening. But ultimately, all these officials, it, it comes down to they're subject to the, the code in the Bible and sort of acting in accord with that, right? Yes. Yeah, so there's that's the layers that you got to kind of see. You have to sort of put one, connect the dots. And that why, is, why are they swearing an oath to, to the Queen Elizabeth? It's partly because of the charter. And then what does, what does Queen Elizabeth, Elizabeth's oath say? Because they are subject to that, because they have a full-on uh, allegiance to her. So no matter what her thing is, that they have to be in allegiance with that. So then you go a step further. Well, okay, now it's the Bible. Well, if it's the Bible, I better read what's in the Bible. You see, so you got to follow the, the hidden layers of this. And therefore, what's written in the Bible the politicians in Canada have to obey, period. And so therefore, the way we take back our power in the larger sense is to say, hey, here's the Bible. It says do things this way. You're doing things that way. And you promise to uphold this. And so I'm going to make you liable for my problems. Yes. Is that the way it's That's how I did an overview. it. That's an overview. So what ends up happening, and if you don't, now you're putting Queen Elizabeth's oath into jeopardy. And I use those words. Do you want to continue? Because that's where I'm going next. You see, and I go in order. Right. Because that's the you principle. You step up to... Yeah, so right. if you don't do this, then I'm, I am forced to now implicate the queen. And then it goes on from there. You get into spiritual realms. Right. So some of the things that are written in the Bible, um, when the Israelites came out of Babylon, and that, that, so you got to understand... Um, the the system in the bible is called babylon and you'll read it in revelation 18 and and um, also in daniel 2. so daniel is a story of how a small version of mankind came out of babylon it's a it's a it's a a tip it's a, a method like it's a story a small version of what we need to do now because mm -hmm. it's it's the same thing over and over. It's just, there's nothing new under the sun. So what happened there was he invoked what were called watchers. So now that leads, what are the watchers? And then, so you go down these rabbit holes, okay, let's 
find out what these watchers are. And so then I would just try this stuff. I have, you know, I had a, you know, a vague belief in angels, but my belief in angels changed because of their reaction to it. Because I just wrote it in there. Let's, yeah, I'm going to say watchers. Sounds like a cool thing to do. While the reaction was swift and I went, okay, there's more to this watchers thing than even I understand because, you know, I'm writing to people like at the UN and, and you know, uh, monarchs, etc. who there is no apparent oversight. You get what I'm saying? There is yep. no, there's no apparent upper jurisdiction. This is like the top of the world. And I, when I write them and I start talking about archangels, the, the reaction was very swift where within a couple of days, a police officer is phoning me and telling me not to show up in court. Right. And I went, that is somebody's terrified of this watchers thing. What is it? Yeah. You see, so that's, that's how we did it. It was more like, you know, I have, I'll try that and I have a vague belief in it. But when you see the reaction, we're like, okay, that they're not off in some heavenly realm. They're imminent. Yeah. Like something is right here, right now, watching. And they know, know it. it. I didn't know it until I saw what they did. And now I know it. Yeah. You see, that's almost everything I did was like that. And um, so we could go so far as to say that, you know, the Queen of England and people of, of her sort of knowledge about what's going on in, at, at the top swears an oath on the Bible and she knows that there are spiritual forces that are looking over that could come in and actually implicate themselves into what's going on in the world if certain principles are not followed. Exactly. But they've set it up in a way to disguise that, like, more, like try and make it disappear and then they put layers in order to to make you think that, that, that this is how it works down here and you don't even you're not even aware of this let alone operate in it right and, and, and it's kind of it's kind of put out there all this spiritual talks put out there's like mythology it's like you know it's fa airy fairy stuff and it has no real bearing on you know life on the planet especially in politics and especially in economics right on the planet we, we think well that's got nothing to do with these forces but yeah. what you're saying is you found out when you go up to the top, on top of the top are these forces and they're kind of waiting to be activated by people who are awakening and, and invoking them, bringing, yes. bringing them forward. You can, what you can tell is there's rules of engagement and we have the biggest part in how those rules, which way things are going to go. Right. And, and once we um, state something, it's done and at those at those levels if you state something inside their court system they just go like well rule against you yeah and that's the problem and everybody keeps pounding on those walls and, I, and it's not a judgment because i did it too i i read acts until i was you know my eyes were bleeding i stayed up you know i was working during the day and staying up till three or four in the morning reading acts reading acts because i thought that's how you you deal with the court and I would read, 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 read and, and put together arguments. And I would go in there with the, you know, beautiful arguments. You could see them. They're like, whoa, rule against you. And I'm like, well, what's going on in here? <laughs> so what you're saying, you're basically saying you eventually found out how to bring the whole thing into play, whereby you realized your own personal power, what your personal rights are. It's kind of like going back to, to natural law, right? You're kind of invoking your natural rights and you're, and you're speaking the right language and you're making the right statements to invoke this, the, the whole system, the, the, the whole overseeing of the whole judicial process on, on the planet. Yes. Right? And when you go into the Bible, like on the page one, It says, you know, God created Adam and Eve, and you know, there's a story about that, and there's a lot to that, and um, but that the Creator breathed into this being, and he became a living soul, and then he gave them dominion. That's the contract, 
not rights. Dominion. And I was having a conversation with a guy yesterday, you know, just texting and, you know, how do I get my rights? I said, you don't have rights. You have dominion. Rights means that there is a, 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 something that's above me and above it's you having given you giving granted you rights, you rights or I have to right. plead to, in order to, to lessen their, you know, or temper their control. That's, that's what a right is. So yeah, you're, 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 you're this, but can you please at least let me breathe and, you know, have a little bit of food and, and some space? Yeah. No, it's, that's not what, what we have is right. dominion. We're supposed to be on top. Right. And, and so people need to understand that, read it, experience it. And that's how it is. These laws that they were talking about in that, in the declaration of independence, that's what they're talking about. Yeah. They said it includes this, but it's actually more than that. Yeah. And they understood that. And it's, it was on those solid grounds on that rock that, that they made their declaration. Right. And they put their lives on the line. And I, and I can't overemphasize that because when you've been in the trenches and I, like I have, and I, you know, I paid some dues, it's not pretty. Mm -hmm. And these guys went way further than I would have. Well, I don't know what I would have done, but that is a big commitment. Either this is going to work or I'm going to be hung. Mm -hmm. And, and in a sense, you know, we find ourselves in a similar position where it's not just knowledge that's required, it's action taken based on that knowledge where we, we're, we're standing for something, right? We're going to say uh, this, we don't want this, we want this in our society, we don't want this, this, you know, and we're going to take action against this if, if you bring it here. It's, it's even deeper than that. It's more like we have... The, everything they're doing is on a claim. And I found out something about claims. So from their point of view, claim is the strongest word in law. So they just make claims and the, the claims can be false. This is what you got to understand. This is why it doesn't make sense to us. Some of these things, because it's not in our way of thinking. They, they have a different way of thinking. Mm -hmm. So a claim can be a false claim and yet it will stand in law. It will stand until somebody comes with a higher claim. Okay. And so if you don't come with the higher claim in the right way, it's like everything's technical, then this claim stands. So everybody goes, yeah, well, Rome has everybody's souls. No, they don't. They claim they do. They don't actually have it, but they do because of the, because of the claim. Mm. But as soon as you come with a higher claim, no, you don't own my soul. Well, oh, and it's based on this, 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 done. Right. It's, it's like any, anything, any law in society that people say, well, you have to pay taxes and you have to do this and you have to do that until you say you don't, <laughs> right? And then if, if you know the right way to proceed and, you know. Yeah, and, the, and you might have to take some flack. So you got to be willing to, you know, stand on that because they're going to test you in some cases, like they did with me. The testing is getting less and less because we're actually gaining ground as a as a as a whole, and they're starting to you know shrink back. But uh, and now they're moving to drastic. Let's just eliminate them. Um, so that that that's where we're at, and um, it comes down to just stating your claim and standing on it. Okay. Great. We're going to get more into detail on that in the second half when we talk about. We'll, we'll get specific with five G. And, you know, we'll talk about, well, what can we do in this particular case? That will be the model for, you know, other stuff like smart meters, vaccines, so on and so forth. I want you to talk a little bit. We talked about Canada and how it's, you know, it's a corporation. That's what it is. Not even really a country. It's a corporation. Start. What about the United States? Are they, are they the same? Are they different in that regard? The United States is a corporation like the capitalized United States, but there is a um, United States that is the Republic and that's based on the constitution. And those that go into the corporate courts with the constitution, it, it 
it's not valid there and, they, and they're told so but and they and they kind of go into shock but it's actually true you can't bring in the constitution in those courts in the way that you're trying to do it they're not constitutional courts they're corporate courts corporate courts so what you're saying is that the the republic based on the constitution has a higher jurisdiction than the united states all capital corporation but if you go to court you're in the corporate court and you got to you got to do and and is that is that law merchant is that commercial that's commercial and it and it's by agreement so it's the same thing as if you work at walmart and um you know you've been working there for x period of time so you go there you put time in you give up your freedom to go there and they give you what's called money if you decide one day well because I have, I can have the pursuit of happiness. I would be happier on the beach because this constitution says so. So uh, you phone your your boss and say, "Well, I'm not coming today because I'm I'm pursuing happiness on the beach today." That wouldn't fly. The constitution is irrelevant in at Walmart, in that sense. Yeah. So you got to understand that that's what's going on. You've agreed to this corporation called the United States, and and yes, it is uh, deceptive. But um, if you vote. Um, your SSN number, um, your birth certificate, all are part of that corporation. So they are assuming that you're okay with this until you um, say otherwise in, a, in the proper way. Mm -hmm. And it's not easy to do. They, they really push against that. So, so the Republic is formed first and then they bring in the corporation called the United States later in, it, in U.S. history? Yeah, it came in later. Do you, do you have any, like, a brief sort of um, history of that? I don't have any dates on that offhand, but there are, there are key things that happened um, that show this. So that, uh, there, are, there are people who teach this in the United States. I'm more the Canadian um, right. history because I had to deal with that. Um, but it is definitely a corporation, and the courts are definitely um, corporate. There was one case in particular where they definitely moved away from the common law, and that was the Erie Railroad case, and that that changed things um, forever. You know, as far as them how they operate. But one thing I'll tell you about the the um, the birth certificate. That's how they have turned you into a merchant. And so going back to the common, the Lex Mercatoria is in the common law courts. Yeah. They, they could only deal, use that when, the, when merchants were there. So they had to make sure that everybody that came in there was a merchant. Gotcha. That's how they did it. So they created this thing called a straw man and uh, capitalized your name, turned you into a corporate, not you into a corporation, but they made a corporation that has a name like yours. So, same thing they do with the countries. So the countries are not, they're actually corporations. We're told they're countries and, we, you know, they have a, Olympics every four years and to solidify that and they have songs and they have flags and banners and all this stuff to constantly put that in your head but countries don't really exist and um, so that that capitalized name is is the corporation and the number is your SSN number in the United States or your SIN number in Canada that is your corporate number and so the minute you try and get a driver's license a bank account credit card, mortgage, anything, first thing they ask for, the number, yeah. to make sure that you're a merchant. And then, so everything proceeds with the law merchant, you're a merchant, uh, your dealings are on that level of jurisdiction, um, and we don't even realize it. Nope. And we wonder why we don't understand what happens in a court. You know? Exactly. So once... Once I started to see, because I, because I came through the hard way and I banged my head against this thing, I had all those questions like, why, 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 am, why am I losing even though I'm winning? And um, once I saw, I went to a, a, a seminar on this, um, epiphany after epiphany, I, I like, oh, that, oh, there it is, there, that's why, that's why, that's why, that's why, that's why. And it just, like, uh, now I get it. I see what's going on because I had the context. Yeah. I had all the experiences of all these anomalies, like why is that happening? And it's consistently happening. Like it's, a, um, so not, once I saw the, 
that there was this other thing going on. Now, oh, well, now it's like obvious what's going on. So then I just started operating there. And again, still trial and error. But the first move that I made as a merchant, because now I'm, instead of fighting it, I went, okay, if I'm a merchant, here's my first move. Let me act it like a proper merchant. Knowing In the my proper rights. way, knowing uh, exactly how this works. Yeah. First move, judge runs out of the room. I went, mm, okay. Excellent. Now we're on to something. Yeah. And like I said, there was still a period of time, maybe a year, where there was, they were still trying to you know, fight back. But after they held me for 60 days, at the end of that, that's the last time I was in court. So why don't we end this segment? I want to hear about this, this time you spent in jail and, and kind of describe that situation and, and what came from that, how that moved you to the next step in your understanding of what's going on. Well, uh, like I said, I did, um, I did some common law. I did a mixture of common law and law merchants. So I used the what's called prerogative writs, and you need to look those up too. That that's a key for any anywhere where the common law is, and and one of them in particular is called quo warranto, and it's a old common law writ, and what ends up happening is the queen becomes the nominal or the uh, king becomes the nominal plaintiff. So as the realm was going out, they had lords that were, you know, kind of held small pockets of people and taxes came through them and then back to the king. So mm -hmm. it, was a, it was a kind of a spread, but they didn't have the internet and they didn't have planes and they didn't have cars. So w as the realm spread, anybody could really get up and say, well, I'm a lord, the king made me the lord and now I'm blah, 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 blah. And, uh, you know, cl start collecting taxes and nothing's going back to the king. Like, how would you know? Right. So there was a writ called Quo Warento, which says by what authority, and, the, and if the person didn't prove it, um, then there was a problem, and it, it would go back to the king. So the king was actually a plaintiff on that thing, because it's po possible that the king is not getting uh, their cut from something that's untoward, right? So that writ is still alive, and so I would use that um, because it, the, the premise of it is, by what authority are you doing this? And you have to prove it. It's a common law writ. You have to actually act on this. And you've sworn an oath back to, what, to what's her name there. And therefore, this is all still available to me. And I want to know where your authority comes from, specifically. And if you can't do it, then I'm going to assume you're operating in commerce, that this is a corporation, that I am correct. And therefore, if you enforce your laws, which I can prove they're repugnant to the common law, then you will owe me X amount of dollars for this, 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 whatever it is. It's just a straight up deal. Okay. So, so in particular to, to that situation you were in in court where you got sent to jail, can you tell me like what, what the fight was about and the f what the f ended up happening? The fight was about um, driving without insurance. Okay. So in, in where I live, BC, they had um, what's called ICBC, and it's the uh, government um, insurance for cars. So everybody has to do it. It's a law. As I was learning, and I had read that act many times, like I said, because that's what I did in the beginning. So I, I knew the act better than most police officers and, and um, you know, could get them all turned around and they'd make phone calls and then they'd come back. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, I told you. So, so I knew the act really well. And um, inside the act, then they've changed it, but I was able to give a, what's called a commercial instrument to the finance minister. And it would be called um, taking financial responsibility in, in the driving context. Okay. And it, within the act, they were supposed to give me a card and a sticker for the inside of my windshield so that police officers would go carry on, you're good. So we did this because we figured out what a commercial instrument is, you know, we'd learned all that because if you didn't know what it was, you'd be just like, well, that doesn't apply to me because I don't even know what that is. Well, we figured it out and, and so we did this. And um, the ICBC refused to give us our card and our thing and it's according to their act. And um, 
So then we went after the finance minister and said, you're the fiduciary on this. You're holding the instrument. You need to make ICBC give us our card and our sticker. We get letters from the attorney general. You can't do that. You can't make um, Minister Taylor your fiduciary. And, and if you have a problem, you need to go to a court and here. And if you don't have a lawyer, here's a 1-800, hire a lawyer. Same letter I get. I've had hundreds of them. So we just kept going through our commercial process on the last on the day of default she steps down okay now by day of default so explain how that was created so the the process in commerce is a three-step process you 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 state your claim and um, then you give an op if they don't respond then you give an opportunity to, to fix it and then once that time period is passed then there's a, a notice of default it's all done outside the court system, just like Lex Mercatoria. It was not in the court, it was done fast. Judgments were like bing, 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 based on affidavits, and this is the truth. If you don't answer, this is what's happening, and we're taking your stuff. And so you're doing this outside the courts, and you're doing that in correspondence with officials, and yes, because that, that's how you're proceeding. Yes, because this is, this is a commercial endeavor. I asked you if you had any proper authority to be in a government, and I know inside that they didn't. I know they don't have it, but I at least went through that process. Right. You didn't answer, therefore you are a corporation, therefore you're subject to commercial law. Here's my move. Okay, so it was getting up to the, de the default deadline. Yeah, the, we, sent, we sent the default. Uh, mail was delivered, you know, morning, late morning. She's gone in the afternoon. And she was being groomed. You, you could see her. She was in the news and paper a lot um, to be uh, the next premier. It's like she was moving up the, the ladder. And what, what would you say would be the reason that they didn't actually give you the sticker? And... Well, if they give it to me, I'm going to tell you and I'm going to tell Jeff and I'm going to tell Bob Perfect. and, and, and everybody's going to be doing this. Perfect. So she, so, you know... She was told, well, you can't, by her higher up, she was told, you can't do this. So she... Well, she didn't, she, we never got a response from her, her directly. We went to ICBC, which is just down the road from where we are right here. There's a, a corporation there, um, big building. And so we went in there because that's, they're, they're supposed to issue this thing. And they are part of the government. They were part of the government. I don't want to get into that story, but anyway, it's a, it's a, now a private corporation with um, one owner, and that is the government. So it's a different situation. It's not actually part of the government. It's a for-profit, so they don't have to publicly say how much money the thing is making, okay. all that stuff. So yeah. there's a million scams like that going on over here. Yeah. Um, BC Hydro is another one. So they, they used to be crown corporations, but now they're private corporations with one shareholder. Yeah, so you can figure that out. Uh, and they did a bunch of stuff. But anyway, so we went to ICBC. We got a, some kind of manager because um, we'd already written and they, they said, well, come down for a meeting. So we go to this thing and, you know, you have to sign in and it was, it's pretty closed. And we end up in this room that's kind of locked down, you know, and <laughs> there were some, some people sitting there pretending to be... Um, customers or whatever that they were there for some reason I, and I looked at them I, and I whispered to the guy you know I went to the guys you know the, that, that's those are military type people like they're not they're here to he listen or whatever I don't know whatever right. but they're right. not you can just tell they're they weren't what they trying portrayed to, themselves trying. to be yeah. and um so the lady comes out and she looks at the paper and she goes uh yeah Minister Taylor and then she's, and her face starts going red, and she's just reading this, and and you could, and then she's looking at us. We're staring at her the whole time. She's reading and then looking, and and you could just see, oh no, they found it. You could just see it. Like yeah. her body language is like, what are we gonna do? This is correct. Yeah. She couldn't find anything wrong with it. Um, we're gonna have to uh, have a meeting, and we'll get back to you. Okay, that's what I thought. And so, got a phone call the next day. Nope, not doing it. 
So we went after Minister Taylor. So that's how that came about. Okay. So Minister Taylor uh, was Carol Taylor. She never, we never heard from her at all. So the Attorney General, the Deputy Attorney General um, wrote on her behalf because that's how it works. So he's like a lawyer. He's the, um, he's a guy that doesn't get voted in. He's the actual one that sort of, Attorney Generals come and go, but he's the actual entity behind all that. So we kept getting those letters from, from him. And then when we, we just ignored them and, and did our process, she stepped down and left politics with no notice. And we saw this type of behavior over and over again, because everybody says that, well, that's a coincidence. And we thought so at first too. Yeah. Cause you know, as, like I said, we were going through just trying stuff. And was, was that a coincidence? Like same day, but after, you know, 14 of these, you go, no, this isn't the, the you know, now. Well, and you know, if what you're doing is actually what you're doing, then these people are in big trouble and they better step down, right? Well, the, again, we're learning this as it's happening because of the reactions. So we're, we're going, okay, this is actually real. This is not some, you know, fantasy thing. We're, we're actually hitting something here because they're running. And it's always top people that ran, never bottom people. Right. People in the, you would think are in the know. They are the ones that tend to step down. Right. Yeah, other people are you know, they don't have the responsibility. Ultimately, it'll go up to a certain point, and then the person who's aware of it is, is going to take the, the consequences, right? Is going to have to pay for. Yes, but it's, it's more like a, a, a knowledge base. Uh, people further down the pyramid have only limited knowledge, and so they, they look at what um, this paperwork does as, as it's nonsense, and we hear that a lot. But when, when you see the upper people running, you go, no, well, you can think it's nonsense all you want. They don't think so. Right. And, and, you, and you've seen that ongoing. You've seen that the higher up people who, you know, have been read into the, these things understand what exactly, exactly what you're doing. Exactly what you're doing. And they know it's very real and more than I did at the time. And the, the reason why I know it's real is because <laughs> the reactions that I got yeah. over and over and over. So you go, okay, this is not... This is like more than real. Like it's, I don't have to even think about it anymore. And so I don't, I'm never deterred by letters. There's no basis in law for this. I see that like thousands of times. Mm -hmm. And every, everybody that does our process, they get those letters. And I just tell them, yep. It's another one of those claims, right? <laughs> I, could, I could build a house out of, the, of that, you know, of those papers. I got thousands of them. Yeah. And yet top people still run. Okay. I think this is a good time to take a break. So thanks for that, Cal. And when we come back in part two, we're going to be talking about 5G.